Okay, I think we're going to begin. I think everybody's uh, settled here, and there's uh, now some people moving into the overflow room over in the Belfer uh, room as well. Um, thank you all for coming uh, this afternoon. Uh, my name is James Robson. I'm the James uh, C. Kralik and Yunli Lo Professor of East Asian Languages and Civilizations, and also the Victor and William Fung Director of the Asia Center. And I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to this important Asia Beyond the Headlines seminar series panel entitled Going Viral, the Coronavirus and its Regional and Global Implications that's sponsored by the Harvard University Asia Center and co-sponsored with the Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies, the China Health Partnership, the Harvard Chan School of Public Health, and the Ash Center for uh, Dem Democratic Governance and Innovation. I'd also like to begin just by thanking all of the staff of the Asia Center and also the Fairbanks Center, and particularly Holly Angel and Tenzin Nodup for all they did, and also for Dan Murphy for everything he did to make uh, this also happen today. So now the coronavirus, now called COVID-19, emerged in late December, a pneumonia of unknown uh, cause that was first detected in Wuhan, China on December 27th thereabouts. Uh, the outbreak was declared uh, a public health emergency of international concern by the WHO on 30th of January uh, 2020. And as of now, in China, the virus has infected more than 77,000 people and killed about 20, uh, 2,700 or so. Since the outbreak began, there have been medical, cultural, political, both local and global, as well as economic implications uh, to the crisis. Cases have been confirmed in more than 47 countries or so. Again, it changes uh, hour by hour, uh, with thousands of cases reported in South Korea, Italy, Japan, Iran, France, Germany, Thailand, Africa, and the United States, among other places. And the, has been spread uh, primarily uh, by travelers, uh, secretive churches, unprotected health workers, and in some cases, there's no obvious source. Yes, this is a medical and scientific issue, and scientists and medical specialists around the world have been scrambling uh, to deal with the new coronavirus. There have been regional impacts uh, in Asia, felt in countries uh, that are now taking precautions, uh, canceling uh, large mass gatherings, I suppose like here. Uh, <laughs> Japan has closed its schools, uh, and the global, and economic, uh, the global economic impact has been profound as supply chains are cut off, tourism has come to a halt, et cetera and markets around the world continue to slide. Institutions of higher education, like Harvard University, have also been impacted in a multitude of ways, uh, from to our students, visiting scholars, their families, and also summer programs that have been canceled and funding for research abroad that still uh, is coming for the summer that will have to be uh, uh, monitored. There are also troubling and uh, social and cultural implications of this outbreak. Given that COVID-19 is a new disease, it's understandable that its emergence and spread have caused confusion, anxiety, and fear among the general public. These factors can give rise to harmful stereotypes and cultural fears. And I would just like to emphasize at the outset that we need to all be vigilant in preventing and addressing any kinds of social stigma that might be associated with the disease. Stigma occurs when people negatively associate an infectious disease with a specific population. This means that people are being labeled, stereotyped, and separated, and or experience loss of status and discrimination because of potential negative affiliation with COVID-19. To be quite frank, when we first began to discuss putting together this panel back in mid-January, everything was in tremendous flux. And we had a gut feeling, though, that it was time to still forge ahead. It was actually unclear if this event in late February would merely result in us reflecting back on a situation or assessing an ongoing crisis. Little did we know that at, the, at that time that it would reach the global scale it has today and that today's discussion would be more relevant than ever with things uh, ramping up even the last few days. We can't possibly address all of the intractable questions and issues surrounding COVID-19 out, the outbreak in a single symposium, but what we can do is bring together some of the best minds working on this issue today to reflect on where things stand and to discuss what they feel are the most important things to add to our ongoing attempts to understand this virus. I should also note uh, that this is just one event in a series of up important upcoming events. There will be at least two related events next Monday, March 2nd, one uh, sponsored by the uh, China Health Partnership, uh, jointly with uh, PRX and WGBH and the world. And that forum is entitled The Coronavirus Outbreak, Tracking COVID-19. That's from noon until 1 p.m. 
Uh, and uh, then there will be in the evening on March 2nd from 6 to 8 p.m. in Kresge G2 at the Harvard Chan School um, at 677 Huntington Avenue uh, in Boston. Uh, and that's a dinner uh, meeting uh, entitled The COVID-19 Outbreak, Local and Global De uh, Decisions During Uncertainty, uh, which will be a dinner seminar featuring a panel of speakers from Hong Kong, China, and Harvard, uh, sponsored by the Harvard Health, uh, Health Partnership, the Chan School of Public Health, and that will feature Gabriel Leong, the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Hong Kong, and a member of the World Health Organization expert team on COVID-19, uh, and also a Harvard alumnus, um, uh, Barry Bloom, uh, who I'll introduce shortly, uh, William Xiao uh, will also be on of that, Professor of Economics at Harvard, Mark Lipsitch, and, Alan, uh, and Alex Eng. Um, and that will be moderated by uh, Professor Winnie Yip on Monday evening. I will now provide uh, very brief introductions to our speakers. All of them are distinguished scholars with notable accomplishments, many seminal uh, publications, and have been the recipients of many national and international awards. In the interest of time, however, I'll be keeping the introductions uh, very short. I'd first like uh, to note uh, that Professor Howard Markell, uh, the George uh, once distinguished professor of history of medicine at the University of Michigan, is unable to join us due to a death in the family. Um, as a testament to the collegiality of our colleagues here at Harvard, however, we're extremely grateful that Professor David Jones, the A. Bernard Ackerman Professor of the Culture of Medicine, who is a specialist of global health, public health, the history of medicine, and the medical humanities, agreed to join us at the very last minute. It's this type of interdisciplinary perspective on the coronavirus situation uh, that we aim to include in this discussion, and we're delighted that Professor Jones agreed to come and share his ideas and perspectives. Um, the first speaker uh, today will be Professor Barry Bloom, who is the Joan L. and Julius H. Uh, Jacobson uh, Research Professor of Public Health at the Harvard Chan School of, of Public Health. He's widely recognized as a pioneer in the field of global health, um, and uh, we're very lucky to have him. He's been <laughs> extremely busy and uh, will also be uh, part of the Monday uh, uh, talks as well. Uh, professor Winnie uh, Chiman Yip is Professor of Practice of International uh, Health Policy and Economics at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health and the Director of the Schoolwide uh, China Health Partnership. Uh, uh, in addition to China, uh, Professor Yip has studied and advised healthcare reforms in the wider Asia region, including Hong Kong, Taiwan, India, Thailand, Malaysia, and Vietnam, and she the, was the founding director of the Asia Network for Health System Strengthening. Next will be uh, Professor Yan Zhong Huang, a senior fellow of global health uh, on the Council of uh, Foreign Relations and a professor at Seton Hall University School of Diplomacy and International Relations, where he directs the school's Center for Global Health Studies, which examines global health issues from a foreign policy and security perspective. Finally, Alana Yuretsky, Assistant Professor of International and Global Studies in Anthropology at Brandeis University, and her research and teaching take a critical anthropological approach to examining global health uh, responses to disease with a specific focus on China. Finally, uh, our moderator for the discussion following the presentations will be Professor Arthur Kleinman, the Esther and Sidney Rabb Professor of Anthropology, a professor of medical anthropology and global health and social medicine, a professor of psychiatry in the Harvard Medical School, and he was also my predecessor as the Victor and William Fung Director of the Asia Center uh, from 2008 uh, to 2016, and I'm particularly grateful for him uh, agreeing to moderate uh, today's discussion. As you can imagine, all of these uh, professors and experts have been incredibly busy and have had huge demands on their time uh, in order for them to share their expertise concerning the co uh, coronavirus since its outbreak and its more recent evolution. We, we would therefore uh, particularly like to thank them for making the time uh, to come here today for this important symposium. So I will now turn it over uh, to Professor Bloom uh, for the first presentation. Great. Thank you. It's a very special privilege for me to be here today for uh, very personal reasons. Um, some of you know my wife was a China scholar and actually taught here a course in human rights in China when I first uh, came. And China was on the dinner table every night for a very long time in our lives. And one of the first things I did when I became dean of the Harvard School of Public Health with help from colleagues is set up a U.S.-China health initiative. And um, among the 
players or actors in that program on both sides <coughs> was uh, something that emphasizes the importance of international academic and collegial collaborations. We have a program called the Takimi program, which brings uh, people primarily from governments, young uh, government uh, people who their governments recognize as promising with potential for leadership that can come spend a year at the Harvard School of Public Health, uh, do research on whatever areas are of interest, and uh, interact with the faculty and take any courses they want. Um, during 2003, one of those fellows, uh, uh, Yuan Li, uh, sorry, Yin Li, um, was called from Beijing to write a white paper when it was clear that China had failed to control the 2003 SARS outbreak. And as you know, the mayor of Beijing was fired, the uh, minister of health was fired, and um, because Yin Li had been brought back early and had been in conversations with Yuan Li Lu, who is now uh, dean of the uh, Peking Union School of Public Health, but was a colleague, uh, we were both invited to the Ministry of Health to advise on what China did wrong in 2003 and uh, what they needed to do better. There were three things that were crucial in 2003 that remain crucial that China failed in. The first is the science was poor. They did not know what was going on. Uh, multiple false identifications were made of the causative agent that caused a lot of uh, concern and panic. <coughs> and the uh, CDC in China was embryonic and not terribly functional. Second, communication within the government of how to deal with a crisis and what the nature of an epidemic was, was essentially hopeless. While we thought when we came that they were obfuscating, they were hiding information and that's why it was chaotic. The people in the ministry said they couldn't get the information from the hospitals and the public health departments, that they had very little idea of what was going on I can't evaluate which of those explanations is true, but it is clear it is essential there be a tight communication in every aspect of the hospital and public health system in any epidemic. And the third, they had no idea to, how to give risk communication to the <coughs> public, and the public was terribly frightened, and nobody within the ministry had any experience at communicating risks. How, it's, a, it's a very treacherous area of how to alert people for a crisis, but not cause panic. So with that, um, I can reflect back on those days in the context of what's currently going on to give you a quick summary of my analysis. And the most dramatic and astonishing change has been in the science in China. Within 10 days of the announcement of uh, um, a big outbreak at that time in uh, Wuhan, which, as you know, had not been uh, communicated uh, to the public or to anybody else, as far as I could tell, for a long time. Um, the RNA virus was studied. Its genetic sequence genome was uh, identified in 10 days and put up publicly so that every scientist in the world would have access to that. That is astonishing. Within two weeks, there were papers in two of the most important journals, The Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, by colleagues in China, describing the case definition of what this disease looked like. So if it walks into your hospital or office, you could recognize it. And at the same time, what the epidemiology was, how transmissible it was. Um, for which I have to say it has been brought to my attention, not by the people involved, uh, that they were criticized for not publishing in Chinese and publishing in English and not getting permission to publish this absolutely vital information. But what I do want to say is the science has been the bulwark of understanding globally what's going on in China and will go on in many other countries. Um, the second phase, they instituted after 2003 a fantastic 
communication internet system all across the public health system. So there could be lightning fast communication of problems, solutions, discussions, and that failed in this crisis. And the third is how to communicate to the public, and the first lesson there is one, you have to talk to them, and that didn't happen for 30 days. And second, you have to tell them the truth, and that also didn't happen. And so there were lessons learned that have profoundly helped everybody uh, in the world at the scientific level, and we still have lessons, as you may have gathered from the President's press conference. We have problems here in getting our public health system up and communicating with each other and with the public. So I know I was invited to talk about the science, but I'll only say one general thing about science and hope that I can answer your questions. Couple characteristics of epidemics. Number one, they go away. They sometimes come back, but they often and most often go away. So panicking that this will wipe out the entire planet are a little premature at this point. Um, the second point is that if you look at the classic paper, and I'm in a way replacing Howard uh, Markell, whose slide you'll see in a moment, but this is the picture of Mark Lipschitz at our place of what happens when you intervene, reducing social contacts in the course of an epidemic. And what you see here is uh, influenza in Philadelphia versus St. Louis. There was a huge peak, panic, big problem. They didn't know what to do. By the time one saw what uh, Philadelphia and New York couldn't do, by the time St. Louis and Denver saw it, um, they were able to plan for it, to restrict transit, to restrict schools, close schools, close public gatherings, and provide information of how people can protect themselves. And as you can see, the uh, epidemic was attenuated by the time it got across to St. Louis. So that's the first point. The draconian measures introduced in China will not stop this epidemic from traveling around the world or China. But it does give everybody time, get hospitals to prepare. And the second is, as you can see here, when you look at what happens when you prematurely stop the social interventions, which don't necessarily have to be draconian, but they have to be very thoughtful, you get a second peak. So we may have a second peak after Wuhan, as it is now allowing more and more commerce to occur, we might expect a second peak. And with that, I would say, that there were nine countries in 24 hours reporting new cases. So this is a serious outbreak and epidemic, and I look forward to your questions. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for coming to this discussion at this important time. You might wonder, given the clear and present danger that COVID-19 represents to a world's population, what it is that a historian has to offer to this discussion. <clears throat> there was a time in the 1970s when many people in medicine and public health thought that medicine, medical science had conquered infectious disease and that epidemics would only be of interest to historians because they would no longer burden the world's populations. Events since that time have shown this hope to be optimistic uh, and at best premature. Uh, now the whole world, not just historians, is interested in epidemics. But despite that, historians do have much to offer this conversation. The basic claim that historians make, and you, you saw this in Professor Bloom's talk, is that if you want to understand what's going on with past events, you have to localize them in their specific contexts. The situation was different in Philadelphia and in St. Louis. You must pay attention to local circumstance and contingency. 
And while this is certainly true if you want to understand an epidemic, there's something about epidemics that has made it impossible for historians to res resist the temptation to try to draw out universal truths. There's something about epidemics that, that provoke consistent responses in human populations across time and place, and I'll try to describe some of that now. Now, historians, as, as many of you know, have long been interested in epidemics. One of the best early accounts comes from Thucydides, considered by many to be the very first historian, at least in the Western tradition, who provided a detailed account of the plague of Athens in 430 BC. And since that time, historians have produced countless analyses of epidemics in different times and places. Ironically, many historians consider the best account of a plague actually not to be a work of history, but a work of fiction produced by French philosopher and author Albert Camus, who provided a wonderful account of the social impact of an epidemic of bubonic plague on a fictional community in North Africa. One of my colleagues here, Charles Rosenberg, a fellow historian of medicine, used Camus' account and his own expertise on the history of epidemics to describe the classic dramatic structure that epidemic outbreaks seem to take in the United States or any place else. As he described, epidemics started at a moment in time. They proceed on a limited stage in space and duration. They follow a plot line of increasing revelatory tension, move to a crisis of individual and collective character, and then drift towards closure. And as he described it, this plays out in a drama of three acts with the initial explanation, uh, initial recognition, attempts at explanation, and then eventually intervention. And it's very easy to see how this basic narrative structure has played out in China over the past two months, and now in roughly 50 countries worldwide. Different countries are at different stages of this drama. And so why is it that historians have been so interested in these epidemics? In part, it's because epidemics are often tragic human dramas of the sort that draw people uh, who are interested in these kinds of questions, but they're also very useful for historical analysis. As Rosenberg explained, epidemics often put stress on the societies that they strike. And this strain then makes visible latent fractures that existed in these societies that might not have been obvious in the absence of this strain. Epidemics, as a result, provide a useful sampling device. They reveal what really matters to a population, what is at stake, and especially whom and what these societies value. One of the most dramatic aspects of epidemic responses are these questions of blame and responsibility. Societies work to determine who is responsible for what happened, and someone always gets blamed. This discourse of blame generally follows existing social divisions, whether it's by race or religion or class, ethnicity, gender identity, or anything else. You'll, there'll be different factors influenced or identified in different epidemics, but someone always gets blamed, always along these pre-existing axes of social distinction. Another dramatic aspect, of we have, as we have seen playing out, is that governments often respond to the challenge of an epidemic by deploying the instruments of their power, most famously quarantine and compulsory vaccination. These almost always involve people with privilege and power imposing their interventions on people without power and privilege, and this fuel, fuel social conflict of the sort that historians are fascinated to analyze. And historians often trying to push back against the triumphalist narratives that come out of medicine and public health often like to point out that interventions don't always live up to their promise, at least at first. The technology needed to eradicate smallpox existed in 1796, but it took about 200, 180 years for that promise to be achieved. Syphilis, a scourge of the early 20th century, could have been ended in the early 20th century by fastidious observance of abstinence and monogamy, but as one US Army medical official pointed out, it is difficult to make the sex act unpopular. <laughs> when penicillin became available in the 1940s, some physicians even encouraged against its use, fearing that easy medical treatment would remove the penalty of promiscuity. By a parallel argument, as my colleague who's here, Alan Brandt, has shown and argued, a similar logic could have contained HIV in the 1980s through public health campaigns. We had the knowledge we needed in 1983 to stop this epidemic. That's not how it happened. 
the advent of antiretroviral therapy in the 1990s has had a dramatic impact on the global course of this epidemic. The mortality could be stopped, but it has not yet been stopped. And of course, there are dramatic disparities in mortality rates, again, by populations based on race, by class, by geographic locality. As Alan Brandt famously wrote, there is no magic bullet. There will be no easy solutions to the problem of epidemics. Now, given the value of historical analysis to an epidemic, it is reassuring to see that there have been many cases in which historians have put their expertise to good use. Brandt was finishing a book on the history of syphilis just as AIDS struck the United States, and he was able to write and lecture widely about how syphilis history could inform AIDS policy. As Pro Professor Bloom mentioned, as the Bush administration was updating its pandemic response in the aftermath of SARS and fearing a pandemic of flu, historian Howard Markell led a team that did a comprehensive analysis city by city of what had happened with flu in 1918, and he demonstrated the value of non-pharmaceutical interventions, especially social distancing, and that was worked into the federal pandemic response plan, and that kind of knowledge is of great value now. And historians are already hard at work trying to write about the lessons of COVID-19. Uh, one of my colleagues, a historian of medicine in Hong Kong, has written about his experiences witnessing the outbreak there. Hannah Marcus on the faculty here has recently had an op-ed accepted by the New York Times. It should be published today, talking about the hi long history of Italy and its efforts to quarantine or not epidemics, whether in the 14th century or today. So look, look for that. It should be coming out soon. Now, given all of this, you might wonder, what would a historian say about the current epidemic? <laughs> Historians are often criticized for being too blasé about these things, saying we've seen it all before. Uh, but this is a case where you can say that in many respects. We have a new epidemic that has emerged in China. That's where many epidemics have emerged historically, whether it's plague or strains of flu or SARS, possibly even smallpox. The recognition of this outbreak was slow which is exactly what Camus had described writing in the 1940s and 1950s. Government officials tried to cover up news of the early outbreak. And again, this is something that we have seen time and time again. There was a dramatic authoritarian response. Yes, that is exactly what governments do, although clearly the scope and scale of what China has done, I think, is unprecedented in, in human history. And then this dramatic response fails to completely contain the epidemic. It may have bought the world time, for which we should all be grateful, but again, this will not be the first time in history that an effort to contain an epidemic has, has failed. There are a, several sad recurring features that deserve comment. Uh, as was mentioned uh, in the introduction, there has been substantial stigmatization of Chinese populations, even those living very far removed from the epidemic itself, and there have been episodes here in the United States. And again, this is something that we have seen time and time again with outbreaks of diseases, especially with the bubonic plague in Honolulu in 1899 or in San Francisco from 1900 to 1906. Terrible reactions by the white populations uh, to both of the Chinatowns in these two cities with that prior epidemic of bubonic plague. So this is something we are tragically familiar with. Another sad feature has been the death of healthcare providers. Uh, Again, this is wholly unsurprising. Physicians died in the outbreaks of bubonic plague in the 14th century. Physicians died in the outbreaks of yellow fever in the 1790s in Philadelphia. Physicians died in the response to Ebola in 2014. While not all doctors are saints, many of them are willing to put themselves at risk to care for their fellow humans. <laughs> now, it's important not to write this off as noble, heroic self-sacrifice by the medical profession, uh, my, my boss and colleague, Paul Farmer, has often pointed out that you could really blame governments for this, often by forcing physicians to work in situations where they do not have what Paul will say is the adequate staff st space, stuff, and systems required to provide health care properly. And so to the extent that physicians are dying because they are forced to work in unacceptable conditions, governments need to be held accountable for that. Now, while history is very good at describing the past drama of epidemics, it is less good with prediction. There are many examples of catastrophic epidemics in the past, HIV, flu in 1918, plague in the 1340s, but there are also many examples of epidemic panics that went nowhere, as seen with flu most recently in 2009. Which will this one be? I think it's too early to tell. Uh, 
Mark Lipsitch has now famously predicted that 40 to 70 percent of the world's population will be infected by year's end. If you believe the 2 percent case fatality rate, that would get us to 70 million deaths. Uh, that is a lot of people dying. I don't think Mark believes that is what's going to happen. Uh, there are reasons to be suspicious of that 2 percent rate, uh, and medical technology is much better than it was in 1918. We do have more immediate numbers, 2,800 deaths so far. Should that be a cause of panic? Should that number of deaths have done what it has done to the stock market in this country, wiping out $5 trillion of value? As many have pointed out, influenza kills many times that each year without provoking much drama in populations. And in China, there are 5,000, sorry, uh, 5,000 deaths a day from ischemic heart disease. So 2,800 deaths total from COVID, 5,000 deaths a day from heart disease in China. Uh, why are they busily shutting down an economy because of COVID-19 while allowing people to continue to smoke heavily? That is a very interesting question. Clearly shows that we are not good at recognizing and setting health priorities. And then there's one last issue of immediate interest to local politics. Does our government understand its history? As some of you may remember, there was a swine flu scare in the United States in 1976 in the midst of a presidential election. Gerald Ford was seen as bungling that response, and it contributed to his defeat by Jimmy Carter. AIDS struck five years later in this country. Ronald Reagan was silent on the epidemic for the first four years, not mentioning it until 1985. Uh, he was widely criticized at that time and since then though it's not clear to me that he paid a political price for his silence at that time. Is Trump aware of the political risks that he faces if he bungles this response? He certainly has been tweeting a lot about this, mostly about the impact on the stock market, but it's hard to have faith uh, in his historical judgment in light of his decision to put Vice President Pence in charge of this response. Uh, as some of you know, when HIV struck Scott County, Indiana, then Governor Pence delayed an implementation of a needle exchange program and should be held partially responsible for the infection of 200 citizens of his state through government in action in that case. <laughs> History is very relevant for how we respond to epidemics, but only if people are aware of the lessons of history and if they respond with wisdom. Thank you. I think I don't need a PowerPoint, so I'm... Okay. <laughs> so uh, thank you for the two wonderful presentations. Um, what I want to do in the next five, ten minutes is to um, reflect with you on two major points with the purpose of really trying to stimulate and provoke you to ask questions so that we can discuss. My first set of comments related to, is China's healthcare system ready to respond to an outbreak like COVID ID? Many of you know that in the last 10 years, China has embarked on a major healthcare reform that the Chinese government has increased its spending in healthcare by four times. So on reflection is, has the system been better prepared to uh, react to, to respond to COVID ID compared to the time when SARS invaded China. In fact, part of China's healthcare reform was actually motivated by SARS. When SARS broke out, the Chinese leaders realized that its healthcare system was so broken, and that gave some of the impetus for reform. On reflection, my view is that part of what we are seeing in the last month or so reflect China has a very weak primary healthcare system. And if China had a stronger primary healthcare system, and I emphasize the term, if it had, that is, it doesn't. If it had a stronger primary care system, in a sense of, when I say strong, in a sense of both competency and also people's trust in it. I think you would not have seen the large number of people who flocked to the hospitals in January and I'm sure many of them get infected when they were going there. And the system would not crash so badly. The doctors can pay more attention to the people who actually need their help rather than diverting their, uh, their effort and energy to those people who don't actually need their attention. 
And at that time, it was also flu season, but everybody just go to the hospital. If we have, China had a stronger primary healthcare system, it really could have diverted a lot of the volume and not creating that scare, that panic, and also the stress on the hospital system. The primary care system would also have been better in engaging people and do public education. I'm sure we can tell that in the first few weeks, public education was very limited. And if there is any public education, it's the old way of just announcing things, rather than working with the community to engage them in the knowledge of the virus, what are some of the practices of isolation, hygiene. The latest WHO report actually shows that in Wuhan, about 80% of the cases were infected through family. So what could have been done, simple things that can, could have been done, communicated in a simple <coughs> way that could have prevented that. So we do not see the peak as we have seen. The primary health care system could have played the role of the public health uh, preparedness clinic role. Now, right now they're doing that. Well, I understand that there are lots of village doctor, community health center doctors that have been sent to the community and the neighborhood to do test temperature, but that could have been done and should have been done much earlier, but that was also not done. I remember when I first uh, 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 returned from Hong Kong and China in late January, a lot of the media inquiry asked me, is China's policy, is China's strategy to build two new hospitals, 2,500 beds, is that the right strategy? I said, yes, when you have already reached that crisis, of course that's the right strategy. The question is, what should have been done and could have been done that prevent China to have reached that stage of having to, do to build 2,500 beds in 10 days, which of course get a lot of attention, and now building even more shelters that hold 4,000, 5,000 people. So in June, last June, we actually held a conference with the State Council's Development and Research Center to reflect and review on China's 10-year health reform. One of the most provocative presentation is actually from CDC, basically criticizing that the 10-year health reform is about medical care reform. It has neglected public health. And I think it's time for us to reflect a little bit. And in fact, in China, when you talk about public health system, it is a little bit unclear. Some people equate public health system to CDC. But meanwhile, China's health reform strategy is that the primary health care system is supposed to be playing a major role of public health. But if you get to the ground level, CDC actually, even though they are supposed to be supervising and inspecting primary health care providers on public health, they have no power, they have no money power, they have no appointment promotion power. So why would the primary health care health worker be listening to CDC. In a sense, CDC over the last 10 years, I think Barry would agree that, have advanced significantly in science. But in terms of implementation on the ground, in fact, it has been weakened. That's my view. So the question I have for you is, which is happening in China in the last few weeks? In fact, this uh, CDC's um, experts presentation last June has been circulated widely again because he's basically promoting that the government should put more money in the CDC system and strengthen CDC. The opposing view is that that won't work. Vertical system in this day would not work anymore. The CDC system needs to be much more closely integrated with the rest of the healthcare system. So a classic challenge that we have faced in many parts of the world, vertical system, horizontal system, is still happening in China. I have to say that the last 10 years or so, a lot of the attention in primary healthcare has also been driven to pay attention to non-communicable diseases. And infectious disease was taken a much smaller role. I think that people were taken by surprise this time. They're not prepared. And if I uh, would say that again from, from surveys that exist previously, if you survey primary healthcare providers' knowledge about preparedness for infectious disease, very limited. So that's my first point. Um, but I also want to uh, provide some positive um, 
anecdote, uh, more than anecdote, during this time when the hospital is fully, um, uh, uh, the capacity is fully used and over capacity, where do people seek care? In fact, many hospitals, all hospitals in the entire China have to send teams to go to Wuhan and Hubei to help Wuhan and Hubei. Most of the medical universities, hospitals, they have shut down their outpatient clinic. They have completely stopped elective services. So where do people seek care? It is a, it is a, it is, it is a negative <laughs> externality on the people who are not having COVID ID. Um, many of you know that China is actually having a very vibrant and growing internet-based online consultation system. In the last year, on these platforms, the larger platforms, the co online consultation has increased by about 10 times. And a quick analysis of what are those consultations, they definitely are not consultations to allow them to diagnose whether they have COVID ID. Many of them are actually for hypertension and diabetes disease management. So this is saying to you that what is the externality, what is the negative spillover effect to people who doesn't have that health problems. And also on one platform, on We Doctor platform, they did a little analysis. About 40% of the consultation asked about stress and depressive symptoms. And I can imagine that if you live in Wuhan, it is quite stressful and depressive. The second point I want to talk about is um, I want you to do a little bit of an investigation together with me because I'm still a little bit puzzled, is this. What could China have done differently in the first two, three weeks, the critical window perhaps, that might have prevented the outbreak like this? So many people ask the question, have China learned from SARS? I don't have the full answer. I think Barry would have an answer. You can ask him later. Um, but this is a diagram that just came out from a JAMA article two days ago comparing SARS and COVID ID. And if you look at the left-hand side, which is tracking the timeline for SARS from first case to when it was reported to WHO to when it was um, the new virus was identified. Yes, if you look at COVID ID, major improvement in terms of shortening of time. But still, what could have done better that would have prevented what we are seeing? I think in that, uh, let me go to this one first. This is again, the bottom part is again, uh, it's a timeline. The bottom part is provided, is, is, a, is a just copy, a copy from the JAMA article. But I have added some of the critical points on the top. <coughs> on December 30th, WHO, December 31st, both the National Health Commission and WHO already knew there is that virus. And December 30th or 31st, around that, is, of course, the whistleblowing by Dr. Li Wenlian and his colleagues. And I think, unfortunately, they were silenced and reprimanded. And if China had taken that opportunity to address their concern and public, I think it would have relieved the anger later on. So very early on, you see that at the top, and the National Health Commission has already sent people to Wuhan during the end of December to investigate. And again, very early on, Wuhan's virology lab has already identified the genome sequence. But between here and January 20th, which is the critical point, is when Dr. Zhong Nanshan came out and said and confirmed that it is human to human transmission. So what happened during this period? Are there time lost? Is the leader waiting for the confirmation of whether it is human to human before it made an announcement? 
Now, I noticed that in the last few weeks, in the last few days, there are a lot of um, discussion about when the government actually know about the human to human. Maybe it is not the same point when Dr. Zhong Nanshan announced it. And if so, when? And some of my colleagues in China will say that you will never know. Only 40 years later, a historian can analyze that. <laughs> And we even said, there is a reason for historians. <laughs> so is it because they were waiting because of the uncertainty? Or as many has hypothesized, this period of which there are zero cases, that's when Wuhan and Hubei was having their annual People's Congress, of which presentation of economic growth is much more important. And again, if you trace back to history, China does have a practice of not announcing things that is embarrassing in light of an important event. Is it because of that? Um, or is it because of a very complicated, fragmented system of reporting that actually have slowed down decision making? So this is a critical period. And from this point on January 20th, then that's the whole wave of draconian policy, shutting down Wuhan, building new hospitals, and so on and so forth, leading to eventually replacing Wuhan and Hubei's health director and also the provincial leader. And to note is that the person who is actually sent from the uh, National Health Commission is one of the vice minister who is actually in charge of health reform portfolio. He's not the vice minister who is in charge of disease control portfolio. And that's for us to reflect on what is, what does COVID, what is the, what is the COVID's position in the leader's mind? What it is, it is not simply disease control. And so this is where the investigation, and I'll just go back to China's complicated system. Basically, it is set up in such a way, after SARS, China built a very, very efficient internet-based reporting system for reporting disease. So if you are any of the healthcare provider and if you see cases that belong to a list of mandatory reported disease, now so the contention is because COVID is new, it is actually not on that list in the beginning. The data would have been, in real time, be submitted to the system of CDC and even the health uh, um, uh, bureaus and, and health ministry. But that's submitting the data, reporting. That's done very fast, I believe. But after reporting is done, then they do the analysis. And I also think that if you look at the timeline, I'll let Barry, the scientist, speak to it. I also think it's happening quite fast. Then it comes the decision. The decision has to be made by the health bureaus and the Ministry of Health. But their decision is not purely their own decision. They actually have to get permission by their government. Now, on paper, it's permission by the government of the same level. But of course, each lower level government is waiting for the upper level government's permission. I'll just lay out, this is how China works, and ask you to help me investigate what might have happened in that period where we have this flat new cases. And could something been done differently, could decisions be made differently during that period of time that we could learn and should learn for future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Well, um, since my uh, research uh, interest is mainly actually sort of bifurcated, I'm interested in the politics of um, um, healthcare and public health in China, and also have an interest in uh, global health governance. So I'm going to talk about the, this both aspects, uh, um, uh, the uh, 
what happened in terms of the political dimension of the crisis, and then also what does that tell about uh, the WHO's role uh, in um, um, coordinating the national response you know, to uh, the, uh, uh, the outbreak. Um, so let's go to the politics. You know, I think uh, uh, Professor Yeb already <laughs> gave us this big picture, right? Is uh, uh, you, you guys probably have an idea what it, you know, what actually happened there? I think uh, certainly uh, there are loopholes in the uh, public health system, in the healthcare system, but I think the root cause remains political and institutional. Uh, the, uh, it is very clear, and actually when I said it very clear, actually it was not that clear um, in late January when I was, um, I just published that piece in New York Times pointing out the strong parallel uh, between SARS and the coronavirus outbreak. At that time, it was, you know, I had only very limited information, uh, but I, I had this hunch, seems to be that something going on, you know, that... Uh, creating this perfect storm, you know, that, uh, uh, and it turned out to be uh, actually more evidence now supporting uh, what I argued in that uh, essay. Uh, so uh, it is now clear uh, there was cover up in the initial stage of the outbreak. Uh, the uh, Taishin, Taijing and uh, many other Chinese, relatively more independent Chinese media outlets all talk about this, right? The uh, uh, Professor Bloom talk about this, like the, one of the few shining spots is this progress in the science, right? They were able to sequence the uh, uh, genome of the coronavirus in a very short period of time uh, and then shared with international community. And that was indeed a big achievement. I think they also made progress in investing uh, in the infrastructural uh, the, uh, of the, uh, the public health capacities, you know, that I uh, visited many of the provincial CDCs, you know, they were proud to tell me, you know, that we just, uh, there's this new building, so uh, constructed after SARS outbreak, you know. Uh, but uh, it was very clear, right, that you have the hardware in place, but you still need the people, you know, the institutions, the system to make it work. It's precisely that institutional aspect that this, uh, the system-wide uh, failure, you know, that uh, um, caused you know, this unprecedented crisis, right? Uh, 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 and uh, just to follow up what uh, Professor Yip said, now there's now uh, several stories coming out. You know, we talk about certainly Li Wenliang, Li Wenliang, right? And he's uh, uh, the other. Uh, seven healthcare workers right, who share the information about disease and were quickly asked to shut up. Right? Uh, there was uh, actually also this sequencing thing uh, that uh, uh, now seems to, uh, according to the Taishin reporters, they, uh, uh, they were able to uh, complete the sequencing uh, in um, the first 10 days in early January. But then they were just told, you know, don't share that information, you know, that, uh, and actually you are not uh, supposed to publicize that anyway. Um, and then you have those healthcare workers being infected uh, in also uh, early January. And, uh, but uh, according the, uh, to the CDC, uh, invest members of CDC, in China CDC investigation team, they were not told about that when they were doing invest sent to Wuhan to do the investigation. Uh, so there was a lot of this, not just a cover up, but also lack of coordination. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, this the whole thing seems to be politicized in the beginning. Uh, Professor Ye mentioned this, the Lianhui, the two sessions, by right, the, the People's, Con uh, People's Congress and People's Political Consultative Conference at both the Wuhan and uh, the uh, Hubei uh, provincial level. It, you see, this is how interesting that is, you know, that, uh, you know, how it can't be a coincidence when exactly during the, this two sessions, there were no reporting, 
about uh, the diseases. You know, apparently they didn't want to ruin uh, the atmosphere, right, of the uh, the meetings. But uh, more interestingly, I found that the, after that we we saw this is a big problem. But it seems that every policy actor involved said it's not my fault. I, there's like uh, this, the finger pointing, uh, I found it is very interesting. I would call this period of time uh, in the, uh, I think uh, basically a buck passing polity was at work. You know, like everybody seems to be shocking their responsibilities. You know, but then if you look at the, this polity after January 20s, you know, instead of seeing a buck passing polity, we are seeing a bandwagon polity. Right? When President Xi and the central leaders now say, well, this is a top priority. Right? We have to now uh, take decisive measures. You've seen that everybody right, jumped onto the bandwagon right, of this containment uh, measures. Right? They, they sealed off you know, apartment complexes, you know, uh, sealed off villages, locked down the cities. Right? Uh, very efficient. Uh, and when I was when I was asked reporters, you know that uh, you know, how you know this could be you know copied by other countries. I said no way. You know this can only be done in China. Uh, <laughs> the um, and that those containment measures, very, uh, draconian as it may sound. May, uh, uh, sound, uh, I, I do think that it helped, you know, stabilizing the situation, uh, not just in uh, other parts of China, but also in Wuhan and Hubei uh, province, you know, that uh, uh, when we were uh, discussing that, uh, I agree that uh, uh, I think many of the experts here agree that the bias time here to prepare for uh, the outbreak. You know, so this is a positive. Uh, but in the meantime, I think we should not uh, neglect, uh, overlook uh, you know, this uh, impact on the economy, right? uh, the supply chain as well as those second order problems, you know, for example, uh, the impact on conventional health care, right? I've uh, uh, heard cases actually this quickly removed online, you know, that uh, when the, uh, I think China Newsweek, Zhongguo uh, Xinwen Zhoukan uh, reported that like, uh, hospital, you know, their terminal uh, cancer patients were evicted from the hospital uh, to leave beds for coronavirus patients, you know, uh, that uh, <laughs> raises all those ethical questions, whose lives values more, right? Uh, the uh, coronavirus patient or, or cancer patient. Uh, there was also one of my friends, um, uh, 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 father-in-law was very ill because of that lack of health care. Uh, and then uh, his uh, uh, mother-in-law had been taking care of him, also got sick, then died. It was all this, uh, uh, there are lots of all those anecdotes, you know, my, you know, but the very tragic stories, you know, that uh, are associated with those uh, draconian uh, containment measures. So we have to also uh, keep that in mind. The so next question also from a political scientist uh, perspective is, you know, many people ask is to what extent uh, this coronavirus uh, crisis is going to open a political window uh, for change in China, right? Uh, in my humble opinion, I think that political window has already been closed. Um, I think that was probably closed at, uh, paradoxically, uh, around February 4th, uh, when uh, after the day that Dr. Li Wenliang died. You know, that, uh, on the night that, uh, it was at the midnight when that news came out, it was like 800 million uh, to, uh, comments you know, on the Chinese social media. So that was unprecedented because, you know, like even those ordinary people who dare not speak out, right, now got very upset because they feel like this could, uh, you know, happen to him. Uh, Dr. Li Wenliang could also happen to them. Uh, so uh, there was, you know, a very strong level of dissatisfaction, unhappiness. Um, 
but I think that also raised a flag. You know, they, they just the uh, uh, political leaders feel like it is time, you know, to uh, tighten uh, the social control. So after that, you were seeing, you know, like. Uh, you know, they post, you know, being critical of the government were removed, you know, and then uh, I was told that even the uh, reporters were not allowed to, you know, uh, talk about, you know, the economic impact of the, uh, the crisis. So there was another sort of like uh, this information flow was just like a tap water, you know, not being turned off. Uh, and uh, certainly what that, uh, well, that has implications for uh, political legitimacy. You know, I, uh, when I was asked that question, I think very likely uh, the uh, government leaders are going to model through the crisis because uh, uh, the, um, uh, not only but they can now point it to how effective those containment measures are, uh, they could also uh, point to the cases now uh, internationally, right, the, including the United States. They say right, that because, the, you know, that uh, they will uh, see how inefficient they are, right, that uh, in uh, uh, testing the cases, you know, now they, uh, I already actually saw those posts now uh, saying, you know, that how, you know, it shows the, the, uh, the comparative advantages of the China model, right, uh, but when we say that, certain what the advantages, as Professor Ye said, when you reach a crisis situation like that, indeed, this shows advantages of the system. But we should also ask the question, how did we get here, right? Uh, so uh, the, 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 it is interesting that now, you know, have all this, you know, now, uh, these articles now, even books now already being published are praising, you know, how good the system uh, is uh, uh, in responding to the uh, crisis. And, uh, um, and we are likely going to see probably like the business, you know, back to usual, you know, when that crisis is over. Um, so I'm sorry to give you that uh, sort of, uh, how many minutes do I have? Just a few minutes. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the governance aspects, uh, uh, global health governance. Uh, when we talk of global health governance, certainly right, the, the, uh, the guarding of the global health is the World Health Organization. Right? The people turn to uh, the WHO you know, for data, information, and also for guidelines on tackling uh, the uh, the crisis, you know, but uh, uh, people, uh, some of the global health experts were very critical of what uh, WHO was doing, including um, that uh, Dr. Tedros remarks uh, in uh, Beijing, as well as the recent uh, the the, uh, the visit of WHO expert team to China. You know, some commented that uh, when they saw uh, those, the, uh, the, the head of the expert team uh, was doing the presentation, it was just like, uh, you know, there was a China state broadcaster was like uh, uh, doing how to praise, you know, the, how good, uh, you know, uh, the, the system uh, uh, was in responding to the outbreak. I, I think, uh, you know, that uh, this, these criticisms were not, uh, uh, Fail enough in terms of, uh, um, in terms that they fail to recognize, you know, that WHO uh, is a member state-driven process in terms of decision making. You know, you could certainly point to you know, what WHO did during the 2003 SARS outbreak. You know, we have. Uh, Dr. Uh, Gru Brontland, you know, showed strong leadership, uh, issuing travel advisories in 55 years history, you know, uh, publicly chastising Beijing for not being cooperative, you know, uh, in allowing WHO team in, in China, and also played a very constructive role in terms of accelerating uh, the, re uh, the uh, revising of the international health regulations. Uh, but it was precisely because that, that the WHO was too successful uh, during the SARS outbreak that allowed this it to play a, a less active role in this current outbreak because during the revision of the IHR, the member states feel like it's, the WHO was, was given too much freedom. Uh, so uh, the, the newly uh, revised IHI actually allowed the states to gain, regain the sovereignty. Uh, basically uh, said what well, the states could do 
essentially whatever they want based on their national law. And they could uh, you know, uh, even uh, do things you know, like uh, uh, forgetting about the WHO recommendations you know, as long as you, you believe that it fits you know, its own domestic uh, uh, situation. So uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm sympathetic with Dr. Tedros as well as the uh, WHO, the investigation team in China, because they really they didn't have much uh, autonomy uh, in, um, in uh, making the decisions. But, but I also want to point it out you know, that the WHO was indeed uh, given uh, the, some autonomy uh, through the international health re regulations that could allow it to demonstrate more leadership uh, in this current outbreak. For example, WHO was allowed to issue, to declare a public health emergency of international concern. Right? But uh, this time, obviously, they didn't declare it in, in a timely manner. Right? Uh, WHO was allowed to uh, actually authorize to use non-governmental source of information in decision making. They choose to not to use that. WHO was allowed to name and shame, you know, basically ask, you know, if countries fail to be cooperative, you know, to uh, re refuse WHO help, it, the, the WHO could share that information with other countries. Uh, this is the naming shaming process certainly was not uh, pursued. Uh, so there's a lot of these rooms that WHO could maneuver but it failed to do so, you know. So I think um, I'll stop there. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Last but not least, um, for a little bit more social commentary, I think. Um, I'll just preface with, I, I can remember uh, getting ready to go out and do my field work for my dissertation and SARS hit. Uh, and just like today, universities were prohibiting uh, anyone from going to China on university business. And I was thankful that SARS ended just before I was supposed to go out to the field. Uh, and when I came back, there was a conference over at the Kennedy School about SARS. Uh, which resulted in a book that I'll, I'll mention a little bit today. Uh, so, but if we go back to 2014, our eyes were on Western Africa, and the world was bracing for a pandemic of Ebola. With memories of SARS as perhaps the most recent global pandemic before that in mind, people, including myself, started to question why Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone couldn't just quarantine people and just have it all done and over with. After all, China had, imp had imposed mass quarantines like that in 2003. They canceled a major national holiday to prevent millions of people from traveling, just like what we're seeing today, after they finally admitted to what was happening inside their borders, and it worked. SARS was brought under control in a matter of weeks and declared over in a matter of months, and China won praises for its effective quarantine measures, even in the wake of all the blundering and cover-ups that had gone on in the beginning of the SARS uh, epidemic, the first pandemic of the 21st century. It worked so well that it seemed like a good solution for West Africa. But it didn't work well there because they didn't have an authoritarian system to enforce quarantine measures like China did. And the government didn't have nearly the level of control over people's daily actions and movement. Where an authoritarian government was able to, to threaten people with punishment for violating quarantine orders or passing along, along false rumors, the governments in West Africa were powerless and faced riots in response to quarantine efforts. The Chinese government went even further with fever check stations. Anyone who walked into an airport, a train station, a hotel, anywhere where there were public gatherings during the time, and up until today, uh, you know, still when you walk through the airport in, in China, there are fever check stations. But the fact that that epidemic was able to, to spread so far without check was not surprising. I think as Winnie's told us, um, and as we, 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 we've heard today, China didn't have a very strong health system back then. Um, but they learned their lesson, and they renewed their commitment to health and strengthened their health system after SARS 
uh, partially aided by the influence of the WHO uh, through the international health regulations that, that Yan Zhong was just telling us about, that were modified so that emerging, new emerging pathogens that are now able to threaten global health can be brought under control and be brought in check to, pre to prevent a pandemic or to hopefully protect a, a pandemic outbreak. And that's what the IHR are meant for. Whether they work or not is another, that's, that's another discussion for another day. Um, but China did its part. And as my colleague Kate Mason has told us in her book, Infectious Change, they professionalized their public health system after SARS. They replaced experts, people who were supposedly public health ex experts, with people who were actually professionally trained, um, who came with degrees in epidemiology and other scientific fields from prestigious universities, both in China, Hong Kong, Europe, and the United States. And I think we can feel safe now that China's public health response to the current epidemic is really actually in good hands. If we look at the central level, if we look at the, at the central CDC, um, it's in the hands of people like the chief epidemiologist for the, CD, for the Chinese CDC, Wu Zunyo, who I've known well through my work on HIV. Um, he ran the HIV response for China for many years. He was trained under Roger Deedles, the epidemiologist Roger Deedles, and through Roger's mentorship, Wu Zunyo has trained dozens and dozens of epidemiologists in China, people who have, again, who have gone to UCLA um, and Yale and, and, and trained. And so these are the people who are back in China now who are running, who, you know, who, who, who can get this epidemic under control. Um, they developed the strong surveillance system that Winnie talked about, uh, a reporting system that can detect a disease outbreak and really elevate that detection to the central level very, very quickly, right? Uh, connecting uh, municipal governments with the central CDC, a sentinel surveillance system that's been effective in controlling outbreaks of H1N1 and avian influ influenza, um, and gave the Chinese CDC the confidence to say that SARS would never return. Yet, I think what we've seen is that somehow China wasn't prepared to, pr to respond to this current uh, coronavirus outbreak that, that broke out in Wuhan uh, in, in December. And Lori Garrett, who was, I guess, was, was Yan Zhong's colleague at, um, at the, uh, the Council on Foreign Relations, who was singing China's praises in 2014 and, get, and trying to get Africa to institute measures that China had, had uh, instituted during SARS, is now writing about how, how China's incompetence is endangering the world. And I think there are many reasons we can ascribe for the lack of preparedness. And Professor Yip and Professor Huang has talked about um, some, of these, some of these reasons. Um, but, you know, there's also, uh, there's, there's feasibility, there's, there, there, there's issues of sort of feasibility of always being in the mode of preparedness, right? If you, if you develop a system like that um, where you're on the ready and you can be prepared, how long can you, how long can you maintain that level of preparedness? Um, how well can we expect sort of a second tier city to be prepared and to, and, and, and to take the resources that it needs to dedicate to its health system and sort of keep them within, uh, within a system of, of preparedness? Would the situation have been any different if, it, if, if the coronavirus broke out in Beijing, Shanghai, or Guangzhou, cities with very, very strong academic public health infrastructures? Um, and then there's a, the question of the uh, of local preparedness and the impact of state local communication on preparedness in Wuhan. Right? How much is uh, is is the CDC and the government of Wuhan actually collaborating and cooperating with uh, with the central level CDC? I think the response locally can only be as strong as local officials allow, and coordination with the central level CDC. Um, with its access to a wealth of world-class epidemiologists is absolutely essential. Wuhan has laboratory capacity, as we've seen, um, but we often see that infrastructure in China is not always equally matched by human resource capacity. And there are issues that are more ably, the, these are issues that are probably more ably, you know, answered by Winnie and Yan Zhong, um, but I think there are things that we need to think about when we think about preparedness. So in 2003, when Chinese citizens and the world first learned about SARS and were quarantined in their homes, they spoke through their phones, right? People need to communicate. People were unhappy and they needed to communicate. They had the mechanism of phones and text messaging. 
um, at the time, right? That's, that's sort of how we could communicate electronically at the time besides email. We sent text messages, messages that are basically sent from point to point or maybe from point to a few other people, but they're basically point to point messages. Rumors did ensue and people did flee from Beijing before Beijing was shut down, uh, but the government also shut that down pretty quickly. And they declared, they, they, they issued orders that rumor mongering was a crime and that people would be punished for that. My main source of information at the time was a friend of mine who was a nurse at the front lines uh, of the SARS epidemic. Uh, and we would email or I would call her and she would tell me, you know, schools are closed in Beijing and my, my, she, had a, she had a teenage daughter at the time. She said, my daughter's home from school, but everything's okay. Everything's okay and everything's quiet. And maybe that's what she was reporting to me because she tends to be fairly careful in her communication with people, especially outsiders. Um, but things seemed calmed, especially considering what they were, what they were living through. Um, maybe under the surface things weren't as calm as she was telling me they were. Um, people were, afterwards we've heard that people were sending text messages about their, um, about their sort of disquiet of the, of, of the situation. Uh, they didn't necessarily want to be in quarantine. They were, but they were doing this through their mobile phones. They were doing this through their devices, uh, through their mobile devices. And people were acting in protest, but in silent protest. And they were in classic adherence to a form of resistance that James Scott has referred to as the weapons of the weak. They spoke out in sort of an uncoordinated, unorganized fashion that he's termed as everyday forms of peasant resistance distributed through informal networks, just like we see today, and constructed through the contact lists on their phones. They were forms of resistance that were anonymous and didn't really ruffle any feathers to get, to get anyone in the government uh, angry at them. Uh, so essentially, these were people who were going under the radar, covering their tracks, and disseminating the, message, the, the messages that they wanted to disseminate, um, but really sort of silently and quietly. A perfect way to do this, as, as Jim Scott has argued, is through hidden transcripts. Discourses, discourse that takes place off stage and under the radar of those in power who would otherwise take offense to such sentiments. Perfect forms of hidden transcripts include rumor, gossip, folk tales, jokes, songs, rituals, codes, and euphemisms. For China, jokes were the perfect medium for people to covertly air their sentiments. And the text message was the perfect portal for transmission. SARS opened up a window for people to practice resistance, which was prohibited with the safe disguise of outward compliance. And as Lu Xun taught, jokes to the Chinese serve a purpose of making merry amidst bitter, uh, amidst, uh, amidst bitter lives, allowing people to express a bitter smile, or what he called ku xiao, to mock their tormentors. During the Republican era, we saw what turned into what uh, Chris Ria has called the age of reverence. Jokes allowed open contempt of the Manchu court during the 1911 revolution, but they also gave people the ability to express their discontent in a positive way that perhaps was more productive than expressing negative sentiment. This is exactly what uh, the anthropologist Zhang Hong sort of what told us during the, um, during the, 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 um, the conference that Arthur and and uh, Woody Watson organized on SARS um, when she came with a collection of jokes that people had passed around text messages. And it, was, it resonated with me because I was actually noticing, as I was conducting research on sexuality and HIV AIDS, I saw people sort of expressing their, their uh, sentiments around sexuality in the same way. So Zhang Hong came with it, she came with a bunch of jokes. Um, she came with jokes that mocked Jiang Zemin's three represents. Um, she came with jokes that mocked sort of, you know, how we, how we revere China's leaders, right? Right, so Mao was the master of slogan shouting, Deng was the master of cash counting, um, Jiang Zemin was the master of stock speculating, and Hu Jintao became the master of mask wearing. And I think the joke that resonated with me most because of what I was doing at the time I was, uh, at the time I was, I was doing research around how people uh, make guanxi, so through the, the, through the ritual of yingchou, right? 
a lot of banqueting and drinking and smoking um, and you know karaoke bar going. Um, and so she came with this joke, what the party has failed to do, SARS has succeeded in doing. The party failed to control dining extravagantly, SARS did. The party failed to control touring with public money, SARS did. The party failed to control having a sea of meetings, SARS did. The party failed to control deceiving one's superiors and deluding one's subordinates, SARS did. The party failed to control prostitution and whoring, SARS did. So there's a lot of public reaction these days. Um, I think st people are still turning to things that we could call weapons of the week, but public reaction in 2020 is drastically different than it was in 2003. The weapons of the week that were shrouded in the messages, the hidden transcripts of text messages, have been transformed into daggers, pointed directly at the government, and the government seems to be, have little defense against them. The text-based messages that created a broad critique of the government through satire are now much more graphic messages that I think grab at us and appeal to people because graphic message can, be, can, can, can elicit such visceral, emotive types of responses um, and really pull on a deep personal sense that's, an incited, that's incited a sense of panic and fear that is probably unnecessary in this situation. Um, really making, causing the situation to go viral, not just because of a virus, but because of the messages that are viral in a way. Um, really making it difficult to bring order or to the, bring the situation under control. So in 2003, we heard about a whistleblower, a doctor at an army hospital, um, right, who blew the cover on SARS. And we were able to react with shock and horror, but in sort of a, a delayed way. In 2020, we had another whistleblower doctor um, who we see. We're able to see the images of him real time. Uh, the, the news of his death got around the world in probably about 60 seconds. It gives us little time to react. And I, so I think the reaction has been so much more visceral because we don't have time to really think about what's happening. We're, we're living this epidemic in real time along with China. Um, in 2003, we lived it sort of, uh, you know, according to the television reports that would come out every day from the Chinese government. And we have millions and millions of heart-wrenching messages um, that are much more personal and individualized at, th at, at, at this point, rather than the sort of the messages that were passed around you know, through text messages in 2003 that were targeted more at a, at, at a broader audience. Um, there's one WeChat site, WeChat group, that's gotten four billion hits by two days ago. Um, and I've just, I brought just a couple of the posts that have been posted. Uh, this is real, real incidents and a real thing. Please help my mother. My mother cannot live without an oxygen tank, so we cannot leave for home. There's no bed available, and we cannot even get a kit for testing. The community official said that they could not report the case to the hospital till she is confirmed positive for coronavirus. I really do not know what to do. Another one, the only thing I've left is, des is desperation. All my family is waiting to be dead. At this moment, my grandfather has trouble breathing, and today he was diagnosed with coronavirus, but no hospital capacity to take him. Yesterday, he already witnessed his wife die. My aunt's lung got infected as well. We've all tried all we could. We chat apps, social media posts, and local journals. Nothing has worked. I see the National Health Commission announced that hospitals are opening up more space in the news. We called every day. They either did not pick up the phone or told us there was actually no bed available to take new patients. This is a dead circle. And finally, can you imagine? The community did not record my cousin's case, and neither did they report it to the hospital. They always told us, told us that you guys have to get tested first, and then we can report the case to the hospital. And that is it. No one offered us a testing kit. Are you even human? Since the CT did on January 26th, she's, she's been going to the, to the hospital back and forth. She had to wait in line to get some saline injection. She is only 28. I don't want to, I don't mean to, um, to sort of demote these messages. Um, these are, obviously, these are real cries for help. But I think the difference between 2003 and 2020 is that we can, the, the, the immediacy of the transmission of the messages turns into an immediate impact that we're really not able to digest and comprehend 
uh, objectively. And I think, you know, if you, if you talk to the scientists, what's really necessary is objectivity. There's a, certainly a certain amount of, amount of subjectivity that goes into this, but if I think, if, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but if we're to really respond to this effectively, we really do need to keep a certain amount of objective distance. Thank you. Well, let, let me thank all the uh, speakers. Um, I just point out a few things before opening up to the audience for questions and helping direct them to the, uh, to the appropriate speaker, that it was the Fairbank Center and the Kennedy School that sponsored the uh, SARS and China meeting, which came out as a book that a number of people in this audience uh, participated in and that I and Woody Watson um, uh, edited. Um, we've heard something about the difference between the time of SARS and the, and the current time. One of the big differences is the tremendous degree of distrust of doctors and hospitals in our time. It's not just distrust of the Chinese government, but distrust of doctors and hospitals. In fact, the, de the death of Li Wunliang really re reversed what had been the dominant view of doctors and hospitals at that time, that they were cold, calculating, money-oriented, and not interested in serving the people. In fact, the big joke was that they were serving not the run, but the runman B, the, uh, the money. Uh, um, and so, um, uh, and that setting of trust, distrust, goes along very much with what Winnie pointed out, and I strongly agree with, which is the, really the functional absence of primary care in China. Now, now uh, admittedly, the government has tried very hard, especially in putting in a lot of money, to build a primary health care system, but China lacks it. And that means if I took you right now to a Chinese hospital, we would see a professor, three associate professors, one assistant professor, two residents, a fellow, seeing 500 patients in a two and a half hour session. It's impossible to take care of 500 patients during that period of time. So for my interest, and I just pub published a book called The Soul of Care, about the importance of caregiving. Caregiving actually in Chinese hospitals is poor, poor to lousy, okay? The people are well-trained, very well-trained. The, mater the materials are there, um, but the structure of care leads to very poor care. And so we're gonna be actually see at the end of this what the case fatality rate will be compared to countries around the world and where China's case fatality rate should be much better than places that are much poorer, such as Africa and the like. My prediction is that we're not gonna see that big a difference and that the uh, reason is the poor quality of supportive care and the inability of the Chinese healthcare system to take care of the large number of, of patients who were, who were affected. Um, so uh, moving from that, let's go directly to questions from the audience. And if you put your hands up, I'll try to recognize. How about right over here, this one? Do we have a microphone? Yeah, just bring it right down. Now, see, uh, let, let me say two things about questions. First of all, make it a question, not a statement, all right? If you're going to make a statement, we would have invited you up here. M make it a question, <laughs> so keep it to one or two sentences, and two, direct it, if you can, to one of the uh, people on the panel. Uh, thank you. I think my question is directed to our public health e experts, but maybe also historians and anthropologists. So as we have seen in history and in this case, during cases of emergency, we often see a um, serious violation of basic human rights. And I wonder, not only in China, but in the United States or wherever on this planet, how could a system immediately recognize and address these mistakes? And in your ma imagination, what would that system be like? Well, that's a great question. Who, who'd like to take a shot at that? You want to start, David? Sure. The, there's, there's a large body of public health law and ethics about what are the situations in which a quarantine or de forcible de detention is just. And the usual criteria are things like there's good evidence that this actually is a contagious disease, that this person is, is a risk, that it will be time limited. And there's every expectation that that is true for a case like this. But then also that there is appropriate caregiving provided for the people while they are in this situation of detention. 
there was a famous episode during the Ebola outbreak here. One of the cases that was diagnosed in Dallas, the person was hospitalized and proceeded to die very quickly. His family was quarantined in their motel room, and there was no provision by the local health officials to provide food. So this family was stuck in this hotel, couldn't leave, and there was nothing for the first day or two. And then finally, local church groups rallied and started to provide assistance for this family. Now, you could say in, in, a, in the heat of the crisis, it's understandable how that happened, but there's really no excuse for that. Public health departments have been thinking about quarantine for a very, very long time, for centuries. And you would hope that the minute they were going to impose that, they would say, one thing we need to do is to provide X, Y, and Z. And it's quite clear from accounts that are coming out from China that many people who are either forcibly quarantined or self-quarantining just don't have mechanisms to provide basic food. Uh, I have a, a postdoc who's here whose family lives in northeastern China, so nowhere near the affected region. Her parents are refusing to leave the apartment and have been subsisting for several weeks now on rice and cabbage because they, they won't go out. Now, you could say that's their fault, they're self-quarantining. But again, you, there should be basic mechanisms in place to prevent that kind of thing from happening. So, I mean, if I could just follow on that, one of the issues with human rights, and maybe this is the limits of human rights approach in this setting, is that we have the human rights of those who are infected and affected, and the human rights of those who are threatened, and they're, and they're clashing right now. How about other questions? Right over here. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. I'm a student from HSPH. I'm wondering, do you have any comments on the U.S. responses to the coronavirus? Because yesterday, like the CDC ad of, uh, says that uh, it does not recommend us to use the face mask to prevent the disease. And it also sets a very stri strict criteria for testing. So even in U.S. with like maybe 40 confirmed cases, patients cannot receive testing. So I'm wondering uh, if the epidemics first uh, started in US, can US government do better than Chinese government? Uh, all right, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, um, I was asked that by a reporter for the New York Times yesterday afternoon, and there is supposed to be an in-depth story on the question that you're asking, which is, is the U.S. prepared? So let me say two things. I know a little bit about masks, and there are two kinds. One has a special filter that pulls out small particles. It's called an N95 mask, and it's reasonably effective at preventing... Um, someone from breathing in infectious agents from the air. Then there's the square surgical mask that everybody in China wears that is not going to protect them against very much coming in. It can be helpful to protect against stuff coming out. And the major issue on masks, so it, it, there's not a lot of evidence that all the people running around with masks need them are being exposed or they would do them any good if it was. What is critical is that anybody in the healthcare system has to be protected from the patients they're seeing. And what we have just learned in the last 24 hours is that with the um, flight back from the people on the uh, ship in Japan, where there were 14 people known to have virus, um, a slew of nurses and healthcare people were sent out to welcome them when they came in with no training about how to handle uh, and deal with infection, wearing no protective equipment, having no masks, all of whom were exposed. And I think that then gets me to the second question, which I, I have, again, a little bit of experience for, for a couple reasons. I'd been on a National Academy uh, commission after 9-11 uh, where there was a major concern about terrorism in the U.S. and how to begin to be prepared for catastrophic things. Um, I'd also been at the Kennedy School and ran a program on biosecurity for a couple of years and got to know, under the Obama administration, how the government had organized to be prepared. And um, there are 17 government agencies in the federal government that have responsibilities with respect to dealing with an epidemic. Um, 
agencies are each autonomous in a sense, and they love power and money and control. So getting them to even talk together, let alone play together, is a non-trivial exercise. Not often in my experience of a long time working with uh, uh, the health issues in government uh, has that been achieved. There was an office in the White House for pandemic preparedness um, that managed to create a phone call on a regular basis with representatives of all 17 government agencies, unprecedented in my view, in which they all knew what the others were doing, how they would respond, how the responsibilities would be divided. Um, there was a counterpart person in the National Security Council who was also there from the point of view of particularly bioterrorism and security for providing information and collecting information uh, about where any event was happening and how to provide aid, uh, advice, number one. Number two, we believe the federal government actually can do anything or can do enough to save America from an epidemic. But healthcare in this country, as you know, is incredibly fragmented. So it's an entirely a stateal business. Every state has their own health insurance problems and, and funding issues. And the feds, through grants from CDC, go to the states. So the issue is, at one level, what was missing in China in 2003 and missing this time is the government aware of the problem and in communication with 17 agencies in the federal government, including CDC and NIH, but uh, commerce, defense, and all of those will have some role to play. Are they in touch uh, on a daily and constant basis with the public health departments of 50 states? And within those 50 states, are they in touch with the public health officers in every city and town? There was, after uh, H1N1, a major influenza national plan in which all of this type of thinking, communication, advanced preparation was organized and planned and communications were set up to deal with that. Further, the as you've gathered from this group and everything you've read, the key to dealing with an outbreak is speed. The longer you wait, infectious diseases are exponential. One person gives it to two, two to four, four to eight, eight to 16. So the longer you wait, the bigger the problem. And so the only way to do that is to have money sitting in the bank an emergency trust fund, in essence. And the Obama administration created that. Um, that was to be able to be released at an instance notice by the appropriate authorities. The present situation is the office no longer exists in the White House, up until yesterday. Um, it no longer exists at the National Security Council. There have not been calls that I'm aware of between all 17 agencies to be involved in a crisis. Uh, different agencies are saying very different things, as you may have seen at the press conference. Um, and the emergency fund somehow disappeared. There is a uh, request to Congress to pass vast amounts of money, or not actually vast, $2.5 billion which is relatively small if you're mobilizing people in every state to be prepared. Um, that should have been done the day after we knew there was an outbreak in China, and it was a possibility, in fact, a likelihood that it would spread worldwide. It certainly should have been done once we knew it was spreading worldwide, and the process is starting yesterday, okay? So when the Times reporter asked, is the United States prepared for a really serious epidemic? As of today, I have to say regrettably, it once was, it is no longer. Thank you, Jerry. Who wants to respond further? So I could just Please, keep yeah. jumping. 
could, just to follow up of Professor Bloom, Bloom's remarks, could that be caused by the sense of complacency in this country? Uh, because I had a ch chance to actually speak with the former director of USCDC and ask him this question, right? Is US able to handle a, a outbreak like this? I said, well, for Wuhan type of outbreak, yes, we can, but we are not sure if it's like uh, the nationwide, you know, type of outbreak. Good. Let's have other questions. Let's go up over here. Yeah. Yeah, I'm curious uh, because it's, I don't think this has really come up, but all of these decisions and information and obfuscation happened around the time when people were about to get on airplanes and trains and cars and travel for Chinese New Year. So I'm kind of curious about two things. One is how much do you think there was a reluctance to interfere with the holiday that led to this decision to cover the thing up? And two, how much impact on the spread uh, certainly within China, is a direct result of all that travel that, in fact, took place. I think we can say that uh, there's a lot of evidence to support your concerns. <laughs> Both sides. Anyone else want to? Let's take some, uh, uh, yes, back over here. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, earlier, you all were talking about, you know, biding time, um, at least in places outside of China, and one of the reasons is for the development of a vaccine. And recently, a company, uh, Moderna, published out, uh, they put forward an RNA vaccine that they're wanting to try. But you know, the general consensus is it's going to take about a year until we have an effective and safe vaccine. Um, what can be done by the US and by China to try to speed up that process? Because a year at a 2% fatality is a lot of people dying. Maybe I could speak to that. So there, uh, um, one of the outcomes of the emergency preparedness infrastructure created in the previous administration was how do we get companies to invest probably a billion dollars per vaccine to create a vaccine for a disease we don't have and we don't know it will ever have. And as you know, vaccines don't make very much money and come along with a lot of liability um, because people are fearful of uh, vaccines, number one. And vaccines are relatively unique in the health business in that drugs go into people who are sick and there's a greater tolerance for risk if the choice is living or getting an adverse effect for two weeks, uh, you'd prefer to live. Vaccines go into healthy people. That's by definition what their use is. So um, one has to be enormously careful. So um, BARDA, which is uh, an agency of the government that was designed to create public sector vaccines, initially for anthrax to protect against bioterrorism, also for uh, some other agents, and linked up with the NIH and other agencies to oversee getting vaccines out for Ebola. Um, the technical things that have happened since then are new scientific approaches to vaccines that once you have a DNA sequence, it's a matter of days or weeks till you have a potential vaccine candidate. That's unprecedented in global history. Not every candidate vaccine will protect or provide the appropriate immune response, so you have to test it in mice and other animals. That takes time, and you, because you put vaccines into normal people, you just can't go rush off sticking this stuff into people because there's an emergency that may go away on its own and then um, uh, cause more harm than good. So the second step is you have to test multiple candidates at multiple levels to see which ones have the best combination of antigens that might give protections in humans, and everybody in the pharmaceutical and vaccine business knows we could cure every disease of mice, but what they tell us doesn't always work in humans. So you still have to do human trials, and one of the things we learned in the case of, um, of uh, HIV, you can't use people in developing countries for guinea pigs. You have to use people within your own country, which means we have to deal with all the FDA regulations and rules here uh, to provide enormous amounts of information on the quality and safety of the vaccine. Um, 
In the case of Ebola, the vaccines were finally produced and able to be used in people essentially after the epidemic was over. And people complained about that. That was a blessing. I mean, in fact, the vaccine was used, was found to be 100% protective of c dealing with contacts of patients. Um, and it, it, it was done in record time. Um, but usually what happens is you invest vast amounts of time, effort, and money. And if it's a seasonal or an outbreak that is under control from public health means, the companies who do this get no money or very little money. So the limiting factors here, I think I would ask to you to consider two things. We do need to consider safety. There are possibilities for waivers in desperate and crisis situations where people could get an investigational drug license and agree to be a volunteer, if they're sick and threatened, to be a volunteer as everybody with Ebola was, to accept a new vaccine. And the vaccine worked for Ebola and it might work for here, even though it hasn't been approved by the FDA or WHO or pre-qualified. The second thing I think I have to say that you haven't seen in the newspapers, there is a situation in dengue hemorrhagic fever where if you've had a prior exposure, you're not only not protected against the second strain, the antibodies from the first accelerate infection and cause severe disease in the second. There are seven papers of other coronaviruses that indicate that, probability, that possibility so-called immune enhancement, in some individuals could make things worse. So the safety issues will be here, and that's why Tony Fauci, who knows we could get the Moderna vaccine out in three months, and that was the, the target. The, the target for BARDA was 60 days to have a vaccine for a bioterrorist event. The problem is the safety issue, and I think it will have to be dealt with carefully. There are multiple vaccines being tested in China, and I don't know enough about the safety restrictions. They're already going into people now. U.S. vaccines. Yeah. Thank you. This is a great panel. I so appreciate that. But my question is, um, what, measure of, thank you, what measure of confidence do you have in the current statistics now in China about degree of uh, the incidence and mortality, and then with that, the decision of the Chinese government to encourage people to go back to work. I'm not the best person to talk about the, the second piece, but we were on the phone uh, on um, uh, yesterday with um, um, the dean of the medical school in Hong Kong, who is really on top of uh, 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 the numbers in the whole country. And he indicated in the looking at the data that he has recently seen and was skeptical about the numbers, and clearly the numbers were terrible, that at least the data he's seen from Guangdong and from Hong Kong, the numbers are pretty accurate at that level coming from the, the National Health uh, Council. I second Barry that in terms of the, the quality of the data, I think for a province other than Hubei, I think the uh, the data, I mean, the confirmed cases, the death, you know, fatalities, I mean, uh, are probably more accurate than those reported from Hubei, uh, you know, Wuhan also. Uh, uh, that the, the, there was people did the, this exercise, you know, because for time. They actually divided the uh, the fatalities, you know, by the confirmed cases. Always like a perfect two point one percent, you know, like for almost yeah. ten days. Right. You say if you submit that to the paper well, for publication, right? It's you would it's going to be rejected because it's a, apparently doctored, right? Uh, so, uh, but but I think the data, the quality is indeed improving, uh, but. Uh, I'm not sure to what extent nowadays, given this incentive by right, to resume uh, work and production, uh, how that is going to affect the quality of the data. You know, certainly there's a very strong incentive now uh, for Beijing, you know, to uh, uh, minimize the losses caused by the draconian containment measures. Yeah, we, we've seen in SARS and H1N1 
in just about every epidemic from China, the management of data. And, you know, for this we know that there's a whole group of, uh, there were a whole group of early reports that the cases began not in December, but in, but in November, which is exactly the same time that the SARS began in November. So I think being skeptical about the data, the data from Wuhan and from Hubei, I think especially, is, is, a, good, is a good idea. I think on your question about returning to work and to school, um, I mean, I thought that the graph that Barry draw showed that if you relax, and when you see the first reduction and relax, you can see a second peak. And I think this is what is worrisome. But if, and, and I mean, if you look at a lot of places in China, they're not like Wuhan situation, but they're self-imposing themselves in terms of quarantine, like as if they're in the Wuhan situation, which I think that could be moderate returning to activities. Um, um, but, then, but then it's not completely let down. Yeah. Um. Other questions, the, the, you know, this is the Asia Center, so uh, does anyone have any questions about the rest of Asia besides China? <laughs> I, I, I would point out that, you know, uh, yesterday, Japan. Korea exceeded China in the reporting of new cases for the day, and that Japan has a, a substantial epidemic underway, and other Asian countries are involved. A kind of hint to the audience. So, yeah, yes, are you going to ask about this? Uh, My question is about South Korea right now because um, <laughs> um, I we I'm from another university. We have students right now in South Korea. Those about to start their sem sem uh, semester, and they left before the current situation. Uh, it's level three right now, so we're wondering whether we need to bring them back. I think the the debate about Italy and South Korea is that Italy people are over anxious. And South Korea, knowing not too many people care about it in this country. I think the I think the, the the point you're making is really important for us to take into account that that China is not the only example today. That the you know is this uh, a prelude to a pandemic? My own feeling is, and I'd be interested in Barry's response to this. That actually we have the scientific data today to say this is a pa pandemic that the data is being ma managed by WHO, which for a variety of political reasons does not yet want to call this a pandemic. Well, it already says it's not going to declare it a pandemic, okay. uh, yeah. So yeah. because it's phased out from its category. Uh, right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but but yeah, so yeah. The, the definition of a, of a, of a pandemic, uh, uh, people are fixated on the words. And I think this is an example where the words don't mean what you think they do. Uh, pandemic means community spread in multiple continents. We could call this a pandemic two weeks ago. Um, there's no question that it has reached multiple continents. There hasn't been spread in Nigeria yet, but there will be. And um, uh, so the issue is how to give countries time to prepare to be told that this is the top level crisis that we know how to put a label on. And if everybody has bought up all the masks and food and whatever, calling it a pandemic is not helping the populations. If you can get them to think seriously about preparing in advance. And I think that's where Tedros has got a very narrow path to, to go through and has been reluctant to create that kind of panic. In Korea, we had uh, the privilege of meeting a representative from uh, the Korean consulate here. The government of Korea is very concerned. And I just pointed out in my talk, on one day, they did 88,000 tests, which means they're not testing people just that went to hospital. They're testing people that might be in the community and spreading infection that have low-level respiratory infection. I don't know any other country doing that. So I think at the medical and scientific level, as far as I can tell, they're doing an awful lot of uh, very important work. Other questions? Uh, way back there, we'll take one question. So uh, my parents right now were still in northeast of China, and they were not allowed to move out of their neighborhoods. So I was wondering whether the shutdown cities or control mobility is the only effective way to tackle the crisis. Uh, 
also uh, over one month ago, I went to over 20, you know, 20 CVS here. All marks are sold out. Uh, so I would like to know what's the risk, current risk in Boston? Because the university encouraged us to prepare, but how can we compare, you know, prepare for this crisis? Thank you. <laughs> well, um, if you took my previous comment yes. seriously, that <laughs> surgical masks are not going to protect you against very much, you're probably not missing much. Um, <laughs> Uh, on the issue of uh, N95 masks, um, uh, they're in really short supply, and the healthcare system has a stockpile. The federal government has a stockpile, um, and each city that had emergency planning has a stockpile for healthcare workers. And if you have to know one thing, if the healthcare workers start to die of an infection, then chaos follows because there is nowhere else to go and you've lost total trust yes. in the ability of the government to protect you. So um, uh, 3M stock that makes the N95 mass has gone up quite significantly in the last <laughs> two days. So the problem is recognized, but we are a couple weeks uh, behind uh, the curve uh, in that sense. We'll take one more question. I just, I just add one yeah. thing to that. I mean, I, I, I think what the, what the shortage in, and the run on masks in this country shows us, and yeah, I, I think that there's been at least six weeks where you, know, you haven't been able to get a mask in a CVS. It shows us what our tolerance for risk has become. Yeah. If there's an it's become panic, very low. If there's an example of panic, we must be the example. Yeah. Yes. The flu that this has been uh, likened to has a seasonal influence in also North South Hemisphere because the you know the summer up here is the winter down there and um, just if you have any thoughts on that. So lots of people are worrying about um, uh, two things and one is seasonality. Uh, SARS went away. It started in the autumn and it went away in the summertime. Flu comes every year and it comes starting in the fall and peak in the winter and goes away, not completely, but away in the summer and then it comes back. People would really like to know whether uh, this infection is going to come back and whether it has the same seasonality as SARS does. It's a related virus. There are obviously no data that anybody can provide and we really don't know, but Mark Lipchitz has done studies of cases in different parts of China versus Hong Kong, which is a tropical climate, although um, in the hemisphere it's still winter time. And there's no evidence at this point that this virus shows any seasonality. Um, and in seasonality, it, this coronavirus is like cold and dry climate, and it doesn't, SARS didn't like humid, high uh, absolute humidity, and warm temperatures. There's no evidence right now that definitively answers it, but there's no evidence that this will show the same kind of seasonality. So we really have to be dependent on the implementation of the social efforts to constrain spread. Just keep quick jumping. I think if it indeed develop into like a, become seasonal, I think it may not be a bad thing because it actually will help us to gain a better understanding of the virus and then we'll uh, have a more balanced objective assessment of the actual risk it poses. Because when you are like uh, exposed to an unknown novel virus, you tend to treat it as what we call the dreaded risk, right? That you develop exaggerated uh, this assessment of how risky that is. You know, that causes all this panic, anxiety. But once you learn to like deal with that, you know, and get used to that, especially when the vaccines, antivirus become available, you're going to treat it like a seasonal influenza. And, and on that note of um, uh, more knowledge is needed, uh, which is a good way in the university to end the session, uh, thank you all for coming and thank the panel.